Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. First, a couple of quick announcements. One is, uh, remember on a couple of Q&A Tuesdays ago, I told you guys to submit your videos. I've already gotten quite a few of those videos. Continue submitting videos. And again, the question for that particular episode was, hey, show me what your favorite watch is. And what do you love about that particular watch? And I'm gonna make a new series where it becomes more of a two-way street where it's just not me behind the camera, but I also get to see some of you guys show off some of your watches with other viewers on this channel. I think it's a good idea. We're actually working on coming up with names for that idea. I was thinking about calling the series just for us. Uh, what's on my viewers' wrist. Actually, would love for some suggestions of what you would call that series. Again, it's gonna be me asking you guys questions. And I'm gonna have you answer it in a video format, then compile it, put my reactions forth to the videos that you guys submit to Ian, and I will come up with a new episode, hopefully over the next couple of weeks. But do help me out with what to name that particular series. That'd be great. Another announcement I wanna make, and this is based on a comment that somebody made, and I'm gonna keep this person anonymous. He asked me a question a couple of weeks ago, to which I reply, I will discuss, which is what I usually do to the question that I respond to. Unfortunately, I don't get to every question. You know, it's very difficult since my channel has grown. When I reply to his questions a couple of weeks later saying, oh, this is a good question, I will discuss it on my Q&A, he actually replied to me, don't bother, it's been a month since I posted it and almost two weeks since the will discuss on your part, yet nothing in Q&A. Unsubbing since you committed, yet failed to deliver. Heck, if you said nothing, I'd stay. On today's episode, one guy even got to ask two questions like what? Oh well, such is life, good luck with the channel, bye. This doesn't make me upset, don't get me wrong. There's people who are gonna subscribe and unsubscribe. I see it happening when I look at my subscriber count. I'm never rude to anyone. Uh, you guys have noticed when I get negative comments, I always reply with professionalism and everybody's entitled to their opinion. When people disagree with me, I like that as well because again, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But this guy I wrote, so you do realize that I run a company, number one, first and foremost, and this is a large company that I run. It takes a lot of time and effort to run a company. By committing to YouTube, I've actually committed five to six hours of my time a week. I also have a backlog of questions probably going back more than two months at this point because again, my subscriber count has grown, hence the questions have grown. So it takes me a little while. It also takes me a while to read every single comment. It also takes me a while to reply to every single comment. In fact, for those guys that leave comments on my channel, know that I respond to every single one and that takes at the very least an hour to two sometimes because again, lots more comments now. I also explained to the guy that I travel in the minimum three months out of the year for business alone, not to mention personal travel. And I also have a family and three kids. So they're my number one priority. So I do dedicate a lot of time to them as well as you can imagine. So I pick and choose based on the question that's asked because often a lot of the questions that are being asked are the same. But overall, again, I still think I do a pretty good job on YouTube. Feel free to comment below and let me know that, that I am. Uh, last but not least, and I think this is where I, I may have got somewhat rude, which I, but I don't think I didn't. If you can't understand all of the above, I'm sure there are plenty of other channels out there for you viewing pleasures, just not sure that any of them answer questions on video or in the comments for that matter, and thanks for watching. So that was my response to him. And the reason I decided to read this to you guys is because I do dedicate quite a lot of time to this YouTube channel, but outside my YouTube channel, I do have many other commitments, and I still feel like I do a decent job with everything that I got going on in my personal and business life. Uh, so if I don't get to your questions, don't get offended. If I tell you that I will discuss this, I will discuss it eventually because I've never responded to a comment that I said I will discuss and then didn't discuss it. It may come a month from now, it may come uh, three weeks from now, it may come three months from now, but if I say I'm gonna discuss something, I will discuss something. And I have no rhyme or reason of how, do I, how I answer questions. I literally have a rolling word document that sits on my desk, which I roll through many, many times, and I just pick and choose a question and answer off the top of my head. Anyway. Enough of that stuff, let's get to some questions. And I'm gonna go to a question that came via email, and this one actually came in yesterday, believe it or not. So again, I don't go in any particular order. It comes from Larry Seiden in the past. In 20 years, I've been enjoying watches. Much has changed recently in terms of soaring secondary prices, like hundreds of percents, crazy. These days, my collections range from Seiko divers to iconic Longays, plus several vintage pieces from Rolex, Omega, and IWC that I've acquired along the way. My question is, to a successful secondary dealer like yourself, does condition matter? I've always worn my watches and enjoyed them. However, with recent increases in prices for certain sports models, how important is condition? Brand new in the box versus like new in the box. Uh, versus lovingly worn. I'm feeling a little anxious about wearing some of my precious metal pieces, worried about hairlines and scratches. Not that I have any immediate plans to sell, but I do occasionally move a piece to acquire another. Love your shows and I appreciate the time you take to make them. 
the most compelling watch content on the internet. Plus, I enjoy your personal trips. Well, first, thank you very much. And the reason I wanted to answer this question because it brings up a couple of points. One thing that I absolutely love in your question is when you mentioned to me what you have in your collection. And I spoke about this recently, and that is diversity. Your collection is very well diversified. It sounds to me like you're a true watch lover just based on some of the pieces that you mentioned. You go for what you like. You did diversify your collection greatly, both having vintage as well as modern pieces. You know, you go from a Seiko to a Lange, and you talk about a Seiko and a Lange in the same sentence as if they are the same. And this is exactly how I feel about all watches. All watches are the same. If these are the watches that you love. Uh, you should not differentiate one from another, especially when it comes to uh, price comparison. The one thing I will tell you is don't worry about a condition as an end user. Me as a watch dealer, when I go out there and I go shopping for certified pre-owned watches, by the way, I think by the time this airs, there's already going to be an IWJG trade show video that's been posted that actually shows me going out there and trying to purchase pre-owned watches in under that $10,000 price range. When I look at a pre-owned watch as I'm buying it in order to resell it, I do look at condition because what I do is when I get a certified pre-owned watch, I actually service it before I put it out for sale and get it to the end user. Why? Because we warranty all of our stuff for three years. I would rather deal with any potential issues within the watch before I sell it to a client that actually looks like it's in new condition and is properly serviced that I know it's going to take for the next five years in the very minimum, right? On top of that, I calculated my head when I'm buying. So if I, if I get a watch that's really beat up, I know it needs a full polish, it needs an overhaul of the movement, it needs a brand new strap. Uh, sometimes it may be missing certain accessories like a box or a manual, which, and all these things cost money. So in my head, I add all that up and I know, okay, if I'm paying five grand for this particular watch, I know I can settle online for 7,000, but I'm gonna have to invest another thousand into it. Makes sense. I'm there, I pick up the watch. Oftentimes the stuff becomes borderline where if I'm selling a watch for $6,000 and the guy wants $5,000, but I know I have to buy a box for 300 bucks, so I know I have to pick up a strap that can cost upwards of $500, especially if it's a leather strap, or a crocodile strap for that matter. Uh, then I say to myself, well, wait a minute, uh, by the time I'm done servicing this watch and everything else, my upside on this watch is maybe $100 so that the investment is not worth it and I make an offer based on that. But as an end user, you should never have to worry about it because I've talked about this before. Yes, sending a watch to a manufacturer to get service is extremely expensive, but there are plenty of great watchmakers out there, a service center locally in the United States and everywhere in the world that will do the same job that a manufacturer will charge $5,000 for just so you get a piece of paper that says it was serviced by the manufacturer for a fraction of a cost, expect to pay 20 to 30 percent more than what I pay, let's say. A good polishing job should not cost more than $500. Any strap out there, I don't care how exotic the strap is for any watch out there, I think the most expensive straps out there that I buy today are probably AP Crocodile straps for offshores. They're $525. That's the retail price on that particular strap. Overhaul in the movement. What is overhaul in the movement of servicing a watch? I've told you guys numerous times before. They take the watch apart. They put it in an ultrasonic machine. They clean the movement. They check all the parts to ensure that the balance wheel is okay. They take a loop to every single part, make sure that every single wheel is still intact and has not rubbed off over time, et cetera, et cetera. They put the watch back together, put it on a couple of machines, check for timing, check for accuracy, check for uh, waterproofness where applicable. They put the watch back together and there we go, your watch is served. That should not cost, again, any more than $500 if it's done by a professional. With that said, with these type of costs involved, I'm gonna tell you, enjoy your watches. Beat them up if you want to. I am one of those guys that always beats up his watches. I walk into door handles, I, I, I slam my hands on the table. Why? Because I, these are not stamps. I know by, if I beat up a watch, especially a gold watch, that's the easiest one to polish, $300 later, it comes back brand spanking you once again done by a qualified technician. It doesn't devalue the watch, it doesn't do anything to it. So enjoy your watches, wear them in good health, beat them up should you feel the need to because you can always get them. Made them back as new for a relatively small amount of money relative to the price of your watches. Hope that answers your question. Next question, uh, thanks for your QA Tuesdays, Romans. They usually make my Tuesday, at least on YouTube. If I may add to answer to your users' questions, there's one brand that is in the middle of elevation, and I guess it refers to a question where I talked about brands that are currently elevating, even if it is not so obvious, and that is Rolex. Uh, while the world is craving for their steel sports model, they are coming up with iced out Daytonas, oversized gold yacht masters or rubber straps, and we all know that rubber is the new luxury, and two-tone sea dwellers. These messages are all on the same line, and that is that Rolex is not targeting tough guys like special agents, explorers, and seamen but Novell Rich that happened to earn to look tough. Is that an identity crisis marketing plan or what? I don't know, but they're swimming upstream for sure. Their prices already changed. You are correct. This is not a brand that's in the middle of elevation, but Rolex, I feel like has been elevating since they've been around. This is just all they've been doing is elevating, right? As far as identity crisis and marketing plan, uh, I don't 
think it's actually on Rolex because it's the general population, it's the people that buy these watches. It sort of can make somebody feel like Rolex is having an identity crisis. Uh, Rolex, yes, indeed has marketed to the type of individuals you mentioned, like seamen and explorers and so on and so forth. But the marketing or the identity is actually driven not so much by the company as it is driven by the consumer. And it's the social media aspect of things that sort of drives that identity. Every company has some sort of a message, right? Then again, it's the general crowd, and again, with the help of social media, that sort of creates a completely different identity. With one guy putting a particular watch on the wrist, be his celebrity or somebody famous, or just somebody who has a lot of followers on Instagram, right? Uh, Instagram famous is like being rich in Monopoly, right? I told you guys before. But nevertheless, it's effective. So if it's the Novell Rich, as you dub them, that sit there and all day, every day, all you see them is wearing Rolex, is hanging out in fancy clubs and driving fancy cars, and all they have is a Rolex on their wrist, and that's the perception that a watch buyer gets out there, he's going to go with that. He's not going to go with Rolex's slogan. Uh, Patek Philippe, right, uh, is another good one, you know you don't own a Patek Philippe, you merely hold on to it for the next generation, right? That's the message that Paddock puts out and most of the ads that you see out there. But at the same time, the perception is completely different because again, it's completely skewed by social media, which is why all these companies love when their stuff gets posted and shared and reshared and so on and so forth. Because if you ask me, it saves them on their marketing costs. They don't only have to bombard ads everywhere. People are doing it for them. So the identity crisis that you mentioned in the marketing plan, I think it's non-existent. What you're talking about is being perceived by the general public that's into watches due to the effects that social media has on the general crowds today, myself included. I see a particular product that a famous YouTuber put out, Casey Neistat. He's one guy that I follow on YouTube all the time. I love his channel. I love him as a YouTube personality or TV personality. I don't even know what to call him at this point. But to me, he's a celebrity. And uh, every time he puts out a gadget on some one of his tech reviews, I go out and I buy that gadget. And I have no idea what the slogan of the company is. In fact. DJI just came out with what looks like a GoPro, right? And I own a lot of DJI products, a lot of their drones, but for action cameras, I use GoPro. Well, Casey Neistat reviewed this little camera on one of his recent uh, blogs. And guess what? I went out and I bought it. It works that easy. And it works like that with everyone else. So I don't think there's an identity crisis. I don't think there's a certain marketing plan from Rolex to sort of appeal to the Novell Rich, as you mentioned it. I think the concept you're discussing is mainly due to what's going on specifically on social media today and how a particular brand gets perceived by others by looking at others. Hope that makes sense. You know what? I think I have time for one more and I'm gonna answer one from Ben Gurr. Great video as always, Roman. How do you know if the deep scratch or dent on a watch is unpolishable and needed to change the whole part? Is changing a dial, for example, Daytona watch to a Panda dial makes the watch not original and decreases its value? And how important is the Rolex card date of purchase? I've seen some erase the date and write new dates or keep it blank. Is that a problem? All great questions. Uh, first and foremost, a watchmaker will tell you if the dent is unpolishable or not. Uh, it all depends on the watch, it, it, where the dent is, and so on and so forth. A lot of, oftentimes, dents actually get filled in. It can be a super deep dent in a part of a watch where you can actually add metal polish it over and it looks like the dent was never there. Sometimes the dent is, is on such a part where you just can't polish it out. And sometimes it's just easier, either, either easier to replace the part or impossible to fill in the metal in that particular part of the watch, right? As far as changing dials on Rolex, Rolex, Rolex owners and Rolex dealers are notorious for changing parts around because Rolex made it that all parts are interchangeable, specifically dials and bracelets, right? Uh, does it decrease the value of the watch? Depends on whose eyes. If you're talking about a super old vintage Rolex or a Rolex that you buy today and you plan on keeping for 50 years, and it does become an issue because somewhere in the paperwork based on a serial number you can find out which dial went with that particular watch so if you plan on doing that oftentimes you go to a dealer and you say i want to swap out dials they do it for you they keep the original dial and they give you the dial that you want pay a little extra keep the original dial that's the answer to that particular question as far as the rolex card date of purchase i've seen some erase the date and write new date but keep it blank is that a problem well first of all if you see a blank rolex card uh, on a current watch, something is fishy because there's no Rolex out there that will release any watch from his store without dating the blank card. Because if that blank card gets caught out there by Rolex, they will lose the line and nobody out there in their right mind is gonna risk losing the Rolex line over not filling in the date, number one. Number two, if the card is blank, odds are it may have been erased. And, and when you're talking about guys that are erasing those dates on a card and putting a new date, the reason they do this is because they want the warranty to be longer, right? Because the warranty starts from the date of purchase. So let's say you bought a watch two years ago, then you go, you erase the date, you put in a new date, Rolex will know when you send it in. And the reason for that is because the way the, the current cards are made, 
if you go to erase the date, it's going to remove a particular film that has some kind of a hologram or something built into that little strip where they write the date, and Rolex will know it's been erased and your warranty will be void. So be aware of those things and certainly don't erase any dates off of your Rolex cards. Besides, Rolexes don't break. And even if you're out of a warranty period, uh, Rolex service is the most reasonable out there. I think they charge $700 to pretty much service any Rolex watch that's out there, as long as it's like missing parts or diamonds or something off of it, right? So yeah, uh, it is a problem if you come across uh, cars that looks like the dates have been smudged and so on and so forth, or it has been erased, or if it's a blank card. If it's a blank card, it may be fake, because there's, uh, there's guys out there that make fake Rolex cards that, uh, you know, to an untrained eye, they're not visible sometimes. I've seen fake Rolex cards that I couldn't tell that it was fake, so. Uh, be, be aware if you find a Rolex card that doesn't have a date because that should not happen. Hope that answers your question. And uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank you guys once again for joining me. Make sure you hit that like button. Keep the questions coming. I'll try to get them the best that I can. Other than that, I'll see you guys next Tuesday.